about it. So for those of you who have your bulletins, you'll notice that there is an actual, there's an additional insert and it is labeled at the very bottom, one of three, two of three, and then the back inside, uh, the back inside folded bulletin is page three of three. So you get one page, get two free. So I, I, there's no way I was going to condense all that information and to fit it onto just one single-sided half sheet. Uh, it would be in super small font. And I wanted us to be able to look at these passages together uh, and quickly uh, so that you wouldn't have to flip back and forth. Now, in addressing this issue of homosexuality, we start first and foremost, with what the Bible says about the topic. It is God's word that provides us with his truth, with the truth, and with a framework with which to address such issues. Now, for some of you, this series may just confirm what you already know scripture says. For others, this may be the first time that you really looked at the issue and examined the scriptures. Instead of just kind of assuming I want us to know for certain. And for all of us, my hope is that we would know more clearly what God's word says about sexuality in the gospel. And my last qualifier is that I will do, although I will do my very best, I recognize that teaching on this topic through sermons is challenging because if you have a question, but what about, but you can't just ask that here. So for that reason, please, I, I will be available outside of service to your right, my left, and I'll just be out there, weather permitting, uh, and so feel free to come and ask whatever questions you may have. In fact, your questions help me in the preparation because it sometimes uh, pokes at certain areas that I may not have otherwise thought to bring up in this series. So help me and help, your, help yourselves, and um, we can learn together. And questions are very helpful. Now, I want to take some moments to review what we talked about last week, and we look through these four foundations that guide our study. First is the authority of Scripture. We believe in the final authority of Scripture for all people, and we approach Scripture carefully and respectfully because it comes from God, and it is for our equipping and edification. Secondly, we are aware of our own sinful attitudes. We, ver, uh, verse 2 of Matthew 7 says that we, are, we will be judged in the way that we judge. In other words, we are reminded that we are all judged and we are all subject to God's holy and righteous standards. So if God declares it sin, then it is a sin for everyone. Number three, our constant need for God's forgiveness. God has provided solution for sin through sending his son, Jesus Christ. To grasp that solution, we must acknowledge the problem of sin. Fourth, and finally, our need for humility. And let us seek to be teachable to the word of God by the grace of God for the glory of God. Let us seek truth in humility. Let us approach God's word as students, not as judges, and let us approach with the earnest desire to understand what his word says. Now that we've set the table properly, let's consider the question, what does the Bible say about homosexuality and same-sex attraction? Last week, we looked at three passages from the New Testament, and today we're going to be looking at four passages from the Old Testament. As a reminder to you, this is how we will approach each passage that we examine. First, we will analyze the verse or verses. Second, we will examine the surrounding context. We need to understand the verse in context, understand what was the flow of the passage so that we can properly interpret scripture. And third, we're going to evaluate different interpretations. Okay, The traditional interpretation, the one that, that is historical, is that homosexuality is a sin. And it is the conclusion of looking at these passages. However, there are alternative interpretations, and I'll just lump them together as saying it, the progressive interpretation. And the progressive interpretation is that homosexuality is not a sin. So you've got multiple interpretations, but you're looking at the same text. And most of us, 
would not go through uh, the effort or take the time to study what the progressive side would say. But I think it is important for us to understand. So, we'll be looking at the following four passages this morning. Leviticus 20.13, Levit Leviticus 18.22, Genesis 19.1-11, and broadly, Genesis chapters 1 through 2. Again, feel free to turn in your Bibles there. In fact, it might be helpful um, because you can see the greater context, uh, but I will be explaining that as well for us. So let us begin with the prohibition from Leviticus 20, verse 13. It says, If a man lies with a male, as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death, their blood is upon them. Again, first step, we're going to look at this verse in particular. The concept of homosexuality is described here. Notice that both people are condemned. Both of them. And the act is referred to as an abomination. Now, of course, at first look, we, we, we look at this and we say, well, how could you interpret it any different? But therein, we need to also examine the context of this passage. What is the surrounding context? Well, in chapter 20, you have a whole list of prohibitions. The surrounding context would suggest that this is a whole list of sins. Is there something in the context that might suggest an interpretation other than homosexuality is a sin? And the answer is no. The surrounding context is all about prohib prohibited sexual relations. And it goes through in very detail, in, in much detail, what is off limits, what is prohibited, what is considered sin. Sex with another man's wife. We would call that adultery. Sex with daughter-in-law. I don't know wrong. I mean, and then homosexuality, I don't know that there's a specific word for sex with daughter-in-law. Um, sex with a woman and her mother, sex with an animal known as bestiality, uh, sex with a sister or a half-sister, sex with an aunt, sex during menstrual period, sex with an aunt-in-law, sex with a sister-in-law. So it, it goes through and actually explains exactly this person related to you, no. Okay. Therefore, we can say that Leviticus 20, verse 13, condemns homosexual intercourse. Now, we have another verse to examine from Leviticus, so I'll save the examination of the progressive interpretations for after we finish both, after we look at both verses from Leviticus. So Levit the next one is Leviticus 18, 22. Leviticus 18, 22, which says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman, it is an abomination. If this sounds like what we just read in Leviticus 20, verse 13, it is because they are very similar. This is another clear prohibition of homosexual intercourse, in which, again, it is called an abomination. Again, we need to examine the surrounding context because a verse, uh, a, a verse, a text without the context may be pretext for a proof text. So we need to examine the text and what is around it to understand what is going on. When we see, uh, for example, a movie scene, like a little clip, like a five second clip, it is important for us to understand the importance of that scene by seeing, well, what was happening in the whole movie? In the same way, when you read an excerpt from a book, you read a sentence, you take a sentence out of it, what, what, what is the surrounding context? What is being said? So in Leviticus chapter 18, verses 1 to 5, God calls the Israelites to obey him. And he is telling him, you shall be set apart from the other nations. And one of the ways in which they would be set apart is by honoring him in their sexuality. 
And so there is a list of prohibited sexual relations, which is referred to uh, by some versions interpreted, uh, translated as uncover the nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of father, mother, stepmother, sister, stepsister, grandson, granddaughter, sister, aunt, uncle, daughter-in-law, sister-in-law, mother and her daughter, woman and her sister. Continuing, verses 19 to 30, 19 to 23, no sex during the menstrual period, no sex with another man's wife, no offering up children as sacrifices, no homosexuality, no bestiality. And verses 24 to 30 clarify that these practices, all the aforementioned practices, will make you unclean. That would mean that you are not, uh, you are prohibited from entering in to the tabernacle or temple grounds to worship. Again, the traditional interpretation of this passage is that Leviticus 20 verse 13 condemns homosexual intercourse. Though this may seem simple and straightforward and cut and dry for us, there are progressive interpretations of these passages. These are things that we would not agree with. These are things that we would not teach here. Um, But for the purpose of understanding this debate and how you could look at certain passages and reach a different conclusion, I think it's helpful for us to understand. So here are five explanations that I've encountered in my reading. There's, of course, much more than that, but I've just tried to distill it down to a summary rather than go through a play-by-play of every single possible permutation of a progressive interpretation. The first, well, what are we to make of the passages and the prohibitions from Leviticus, from both Leviticus 2013 and 1822? Well, this was to, this idea is to, it's an attitude towards Canaanites, not really necessarily an attitude against homosexuality. This was about distinguishing themselves from Canaan, right? And, you know, some people will appeal to, uh, I think it's Leviticus 18, where it says, you shall come out and be separate and be different and distinct from the people of the land. Now, the issue with that is that historically, the surrounding nations also condemned homosexuality. And in which case, that is not, well, don't do it. If they said white, you say black. If they say yes, you say no. This is not, uh, this would be actually similar to the historical period because the surrounding nations also condemned the practice of homosexuality. Another one, another interpretation, another progressive interpretation is that this is talking about associations with idolatry. This is about idolatry, really, not not necessarily homosexuality. But in that time period, in that historical context, only child sacrifice had religious significance. So it was child sacrifice that was seen as definite, definitely off limits because it was considered a religious practice of the surrounding nation. Third is one where people may say that, well, you know, the Mosaic law is irrelevant to us today. Since we are not under the law, we are under grace. And the traditionalist response would say that first, the context sets forth moral absolutes regarding sexual sin, that God speaks very strongly about the sin of homosexuality. And third, the reminder that these prohibitions are repeated in the New Testament. Last sermon, (laughs) the last message we actually went through those passages. And fourth, we must recognize that the Mosaic law, the Old Testament law, is still an expression of God's holy character. Remember that this, was, this law was given to God's people, God's covenant people through Abraham, okay, by, uh, through Abraham's descendant. And it was God's instructions for how they ought to live and, to what, and, and as far as what was right and what was wrong. So the Mosaic law still represents God's holy character and his desire for his people's obedience. Another progressive interpretation or explanation is that this may have been downstream from an ignorance regarding fertilization. 
This is about the superstitious sacredness of the seed of life. Okay, so fertilization, the process when the sperm unites with the egg, right? We would call that maybe conception. And so this is kind of the idea of we, there, there's a sacredness to this seed of life and that it ought to be treated with respect and care. Right? Of course, if that, is, holds, if that does hold true, then, then God himself would be guilty of promoting superstitious and, uh, superstition and ignorance as to the biological workings of conception. Though he is creator, though he made us, though he created us to function just in that way. And fifth, and finally, this is not so much, uh, the progressive interpretation would be, this is not so much talking about homosexuality itself, but a specific form of it, which is the feminizing of men. In other words, treating a man as if he were a woman. But God condemns both participants in homosexual intercourse to death. Both the one who did, quote unquote, the feminizing, and the one who was feminized. Both the active and the passive participant. So if this was about treating a man as if he were a woman, then why do both people receive the same punishment? My hope is that in examining and understanding some of the progressive explanations, you are not convinced, but rather you understand that Leviticus 20.13 and 18.22 do condemn homosexual practices. The third passage uh, that we want to look at today comes from Genesis 19.1 to 11, which is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me read it for us. It says, The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth, and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Notice. I've highlighted that we may know them. And Lot refers to this as acting wickedly. They ask to know the visitors. And Lot uses the same phrase, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Verse 9, but they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man, Lot, and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out by groping for the door. Looking at this passage, we understand that these are two angels who visited, um, but Lot saw them. It, well, they were identified by the people of Sodom as men, 
Lot did not want them to stay in the town square. He thought it was unsafe. He was concerned and he pressed them hard that they would stay with him in his house under the protection, under his protection. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, came up and surrounded the house. This looks dangerous. This is not a good situation. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out that we may know them. And that knowledge seems to be carnal in nature because Lot says, do not act so wickedly. And he says, I've got two daughters who have not known any men, any man. So this is the passage itself. And we have details that God has given to us in the passage that all point to a traditional interpretation that homosexuality is a sin and that God judged the city of Sodom for it. But let's look at the surrounding context of this passage. Genesis chapter 11, we find the Tower of Babel, and it leads to people spreading out across the face of the earth. The multiplication of languages led to the spread geographically of people on the earth. In Genesis chapter 12 through 17, we find that God establishes a special relationship with Abraham and his descendants. A special, he singles out Abraham. And then in Genesis 18, 16 to 21, God reveals his plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah on account of their great sin. In Genesis 18, 22 to 33, for some reason, everybody remembers this story. Perhaps sometimes we, we desire to bargain with God, and this is an example where actually somebody bargains with God. And Abraham begs and bargains with God to spare Sodom. Okay, this is an act of mercy and compassion on the part of Abraham. Would you spare this city on account of 50, how about 45, 40, 30, 20, 10? Righteous people. Now, we know that the end of the story is that God sent down fire from heaven upon the cities and that they were consumed by his wrath and his judgment. And the traditional interpretation is that Sodom experienced God's judgment for its sins, which included homosexuality. Elsewhere in scriptures, Sodom is described as a place that was known for its wickedness. It is repeatedly presented as an example of abject wickedness and immorality. So this is the traditional interpretation of this passage. Now, in response to the, to the traditional interpretation here are the four main progressive explanations. How would those who think that homosexuality is acceptable, that it's not a sin, how do they read the same passage and yet reach a different conclusion? Number one, the sin was in hospitality, not homosexuality. Lot did not introduce the visitors to the city people. Again, when we read that passage, Lot clearly understood that their request was sexual relations, and it was reinforced by his offer of his two virgin daughters and his move to protect those men, those angels. And again, if the sin of Sodom was in hospitality, if the sin that is being judged here, then why is Lot spared? Since he was obviously a participant in not being hospitable, in not showing proper ancient Near Eastern hospitality. Another one is it was for the sin of idolatry, not homosexuality. Other passages indicate that these inhabitants were idolaters, to which a traditionalist response would say, yes, also, that too. This view espouses that the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah were punished mainly for idolatry. But how do you then explain Genesis 19, 1 to 11, since there is no explicit reference to idolatry? 
Number three, this is God's righteous judgment against gang rape, not necessarily homosexuality. It was a judgment on the sin of rape. Ezekiel 16.50 calls the sin of Sodom. The sin of Sodom is an abomination. It is the very same word that appears exactly twice in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20 verse 13. Which both passages mention homosexuality. The fourth and final progressive interpretation is that, you know, the sin was about desiring to have sex with angels, not homosexuality. This is about pursuing strange flesh. The issue is that the men of Sodom did not know that Lot's visitors were angels. In fact, they call them men. Where are the men who came to visit you? Not where are the angels who came to visit you? Not where are the men who are really angels come to visit you? So in this particular case, the men of Sodom thought that the visitors were men. They desired to have sex with those men, with those male visitors. So the conclusion, based upon not only looking at the text itself, but looking at the alternative progressive interpretations, is really that God judged Sodom and Gomorrah for its sins, which included homosexuality. And now I want us to look at the fourth and final passage, which gives us a bigger picture look at God's design for humanity as the creator. Now, I'm not going to read through the entire passage, the, but the creation account in Genesis 1 to 2 shows us God's blueprint for this world. How did he create it? How did he create it to function? What did he want it to be like? And in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, we've got, we have an account of what God created on each day. Then in Genesis 2, verses 4 to 24, we learn about the living conditions in the garden before the fall. Now notice that God noticed that God sees Adam's state of aloneness, not necessarily loneliness. Okay, you can be alone and not be lonely. Uh, and God stated for the first time in recorded history that it is not good for the man to be alone. If you read Genesis 1 and 2, you'll see, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. Okay, which is over and over. And then it says, it's not good for the man to be alone. And I think for those of us who are married, we would say amen. To respond to Adam's situation, God created a helper who is suitable for him. The Hebrew phrase is a helper who is corresponding to him. And in ordaining the first human marriage, God made them one flesh, one flesh. And husband and wife are connected emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, financially, and sexually. And Ephesians 5, 21 to 33, Colossians 3, 18 to 19, 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7, all refer to the distinct roles for the man and woman in marriage. And passages about parenting, single out fathers in particular. And let's not forget that God connects marriage between a man and a woman to the relationship between Christ and the church. That marriage is a picture. It is a picture and it is a pointer. It is a picture that points. And it point, it, it's a picture on earth that points to a reality in eternity. So thinking about this whole this, this whole section, these chapters, Genesis 1 and 2, God's creation, God's purposes, God's blueprint for humanity reminds us that really homosexuality is wrong because it is inconsistent with God's blueprint for humanity. So again, is there a specific, you know, a, a specific uh, verse or phrase that condemns it in Genesis 1 and 2? No, it doesn't. But Genesis 1 and 2 presents us with this is how it's supposed to be. This is how God designed it to be. This is how God planned for it to be. Now, 
this is the simplest and the most natural reading of, and the most natural understanding of the creation account and of the mention of one man, one woman. It is also the reason for the rightness of marriage between a man and a woman. Now, here are two progressive explanations of this same passage. First is God planned for procreation, which explains the Old Testament focus on preserving the family line. But through Christ, vines, this is Matthew Vines, um, the book of which I'd show you, God and the Gay Christian. Um, he, in my opinion, he presents probably the best argument, although I find it unconvincing. Uh, but he writes this, biological procreation no longer determines membership in God's kingdom. Spiritual rebirth through faith in Christ does. While God began with, with male and female, the earth has become populated, so homosexual unions are okay. In other words, when God said, be blessed, be fruitful, be multiply, and fill the earth, the earth is filled. We're okay now. So homosexual unions should be okay. That's the explanation. And the traditionalist response would, would, would say that the same God who created Adam and Eve to be together could have created more males if he endorsed homosexuality, but he didn't. And furthermore, if God simply wanted to populate the world, he could have just created more people. The second, and probably the most disturbing uh, progressive explanation of this passage, categorizes Genesis chapters 1 and 2 as a myth. It's just a fanciful story. It's just, it's just a story we say at bedtime. It's a fairy tale. We don't need to submit to it. We don't need to learn from it or take our cues from it. Of course, the traditionalist response is kind of at what point does the Bible become true? At what point does it move from myth to truth? Is it Genesis 3? Is it Joshua 1? Revelation 22? And by the same logic, marriage as an institution is baseless since God, since, since Genesis 1 to 2 is a myth. So the institution of marriage is part of that myth. We can disregard that as well. And Jesus' references to creation are nonsensical. Why would Jesus propagate a myth? Why would he talk about it as if it were true? Understanding God's design for marriage between a male and female is foundational to our understanding of the other commands in Scripture regarding homosexuality. God's pattern has been established since the very beginning. It is male and female in marriage that presents us with a picture of Christ and the church. Is it not written, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Is it not written, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to her? Is it not written, wives, win over your husbands through your holy conduct? It is male and female in passages telling all children to honor their father and mother. It is male and female in passages about parenting when God gives specific instructions to fathers. And when I've taught on this subject in the past, uh, I actually started Genesis and then went from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you know, kind of like a chronological canonical order. But this time I went backwards. First of all, because we're starting, we're coming off of Romans 1, 26, 27. And I went backwards from New Testament to Old Testament. And at some point during these last two sermons, you may have mentally conceded that homosexuality is a sin, like enough's enough. You might, you might have wondered why I would labor to keep bringing up passage after passage after passage. And here's the reason why I did that is because I want you to see that when God speaks, he is clear. He is consistent. He does not have a speech impediment. Romans 1, 26 to 27, 1 Timothy 1, 8 to 11, and 1 Corinthians 1, 6, 9 to 11 all clearly state that homosexuality is a sin. Romans 1, 26, 27 also calls same-sex desire sinful. Leviticus 18, or Leviticus 18, 22, and 20, 13 likewise condemn homosexuality, calling it an abomination. Genesis 19, 1 to 11 describes homosexuality, and shows God's condemnation and judgment for it. 
And then Genesis 1 and 2 reminds us that even from the beginning, God designed humans to be united as male and female. Understanding God's created order helps us make sense of all of his commands in Scripture to husbands and wives, to fathers and mothers. And it reminds me of of kind of this, this experience that I would have for years before before marriage, when I still lived in like Westwood, I'd wake up and go to work and I would get dressed in the dark. I had a roommate. He was also an accountant, but he worked for a company that didn't start work till like 9.30. And in contrast, I had to leave sometimes at 6 a.m. to drive out to Riverside to audit books. Not fun. But so what I would do is I, I don't want to wake up my roommate. And of course, I'm trying to be kind to him. And, and, and so I'm, I'm trying to pick out what looks like blue shirts in the dark. You can't really tell sometimes. But I remember I would put on these, don these shirts, these button-down shirts, and I'd be changing in the dark. And I remember just like buttoning on the shirt and then, and then basically going into the bathroom and turning on the lights going, did I get it right? Did I get it right? And it was sort of like this always this test for me in the morning before I was really alert. And what I understood is that, okay, I just need to get one of these buttons right. And if I get just one of these, if I match the correct button, all I have to do is just work my way down and we're up. And the rest of it falls in line. And in the same way, Genesis 1 and 2 is the first button. It is what God has intended from the beginning. And if you follow the logic, it explains all the other com- explicit commands in Scripture. The first button was right. It was right there all along. And so the other buttons naturally follow, just as God's created order of man and woman in marriage. If you follow the rest of Scripture, it still makes sense. It lines up. It's consistent with what God had created from the beginning. When we acknowledge God as the creator, we must also acknowledge his created order. And this is why the pattern for procreation still requires male and female contribution. And when we come to Romans 1, 18 to 32, which is the passage that started us in this series, started us to go on this excursus, we find that humanity has rebelled against its creator. And that people chose to worship creation rather than the creator. That they reject God's natural order. That they reject him as creator. And it has led to these sins. So a couple applications today. First is that rebellion is the root of sin. God has created us in his image so that we might worship him. But we cast off God as creator and we determine our own purpose. We self-identify, we self-determine as if God were not creator, as if God were not sovereign. God tells us to do things his way, in his time, under his conditions, but we choose to do things in our way, in our time, and under our conditions. There may be countless expressions of sin, but they all come fundamentally from a heart of rebellion. And to embrace salvation and to be a Christian, we need to acknowledge that we are sinners who have rebelled against God, the creator. Though we may do different sins, we may engage in different activities that are sinful, all sin is ultimately rebelling against God. And as a result of our rebellion against God, we need to make peace because God will come and judge us and we will be found guilty for certain. And so we need to make peace with God. And God offers that peace through the death of Jesus on the cross. Jesus pays the penalty for sin, for the sins of all who believe. He lived a perfect life of obedience, in complete submission as opposed to rebellion against God. And he died on the cross as a sacrifice. And all who believe in him can be saved. And with that salvation comes not only forgiveness, restoration, an eternal destination switch from hell to heaven, but also comes a heart transformation. Because what is the remedy for a rebellious heart? It is transformation of that heart. 
and God's salvation transforms hearts. 2 Corinthians 5.17 declares that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. God changes our hearts. And instead of having hearts of stone, we have hearts of flesh. Instead of fighting with God for supremacy in our lives, we submit to him and we recognize the goodness of his ways. And instead of doing things our own way, we set out to do things God's way. Scripture is clear, brothers and sisters in Christ. God has indeed spoken. And though he declares homosexuality to be a sin, he declares that salvation is possible through his son. And it only comes through his son. And it comes because God sent his son into the world that we might have eternal life. And so we thank the Lord for his gracious and good provision. While acknowledging the sin, we acknowledge the salvation that it offers. Let me pray for us. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We do thank you for your word and its clarity and the reminders especially that you have made a way for forgiveness and salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. Though our sins are as scarlet, you can wash us white as snow. Through the blood, sacrifice, victorious resurrection of your son, in whose name we pray.